<laughs> Can you unmute yourself? If not, I'll take this as an opportunity for me to talk on your behalf. <laughs> okay, I'll do it. All right. So Laird Brown, um, he's been the strategic counsel of Poly. You can talk now. Sorry. Yes. Fine. Okay. Perfect. So go for it, please. Uh, okay. So uh, again, uh, delighted to be here. Uh, Poly Poly is a founding partner of both ends. So for us, it's very exciting. This is one of our first events after the Minia Summit last uh, month. We're trying to follow up on some of that work. And uh, I'm essentially sitting in for Matthew de Kausen, who also a uh, Poly Poly and the other co-managing director. So congratulations to uh, both of our, <laughs> our new uh, directors. We're very excited. Well, thank you. Thank you, Laird, and thank you for, for being here um, and for moderating with me as well, co-moderator. So um, without further ado, so who are we? As already mentioned, um, Laird, so uh, as one of the founding partners, so Both End is a pan-European community of engaged citizens, innovators, and domain experts working together to develop better solutions to collectively address the corona crisis, but also to build resilience for the future which is why we're having this very important discussion here for the next three days. Um, some of our values, uh, Laird, would you care to, to elaborate on them? I will, I just have to sort of there, I get my screen a little yeah. open. Oh, can you see the screen? Uh, yes, finally. Um, so for us, I think, uh, well, we have listed a number of values here that are very important to us, but I think, uh, the most important ones are at the top, uh, being open and transparent. Uh, a lot of institutions and structuring structures rather are crumbling today because the public just doesn't trust them. They're so opaque. So one of the things that we're really trying to dial up in our work and in the way we are presenting our projects is to be very open about the way we're working and who we are working with uh, again, uh, data privacy is uh, paramount, uh, part of the GDPR structure. Uh, solidarity and inclusion and diversity, we're trying to reach as broad a segment of society as possible and not just stay focused on one interest group or another. And again, as uh, Elena mentioned, a very important uh, notion for us is uh, somehow developing resilience, not just in this particular historical moment, uh, but moving forward as we'll face a number of other challenges uh, and uh, cooperation. So thank you very much, Laird. So uh, as, as he already mentioned, all of our values and why, why of course we're doing this, because uh, um, technology, of course, it plays a big role. Um, uh, how to in, in the current crisis like how how actually um how actually we can overcome it uh, right and not only in the current crisis but in general i think technology is not the issue it's more like the question of 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 how we're addressing these things or why we're using technology so we need to build solutions that they are from the ground up and really serve individual community that help them build them so we really want to use technology and facilitate technology as a as a as the medium, not necessarily as this being the the number one thing that we're chasing after. So that's why right now we are here to to consolidate and to to use to see what technology can offer and provide, uh, and take it to a step further to actually really serve the human. Uh, and how do we want to do that, layered? Well, it's actually the key of our name, both and which is the opposite of either or. So we believe that we can have both data privacy and public health, both civil rights and economic well-being. And with you, I'm sure we'll get there. So, um, and, uh, and actually we also have, uh, from, a, from a practical standpoint, we also have this community platform that we will be using all together in the next couple of, 
um, of uh, days um, where we'll be all meeting there. We will be, uh, we will have our projects there and we will be building up the solutions. Um, we really want to, we want a place, a place to engage uh, with the solution to the COVID-19 crisis. Um, and this community platform will serve a little bit like an online co-working space where it's, it's something in between a project management, but also a tool for us to communicate with each other um, and, um, and create and, and so, and really, find the solutions together of the topics that we're really opening up now. So in order to sign up, um, so uh, sign up, yeah, not in order, sorry, sign up to this. And I think there's a link now that was put in the Zoom um, meeting. Um, and there you can chat with other participants. Uh, you need to download the Rocket Chat app. Um, you will access all the reading materials. Um, we, uh, one of our objectives is to consolidate all manifestos created already for the COVID-19. Um, so we want all of us to read those and reflect on those. Um, access transcription from all sessions uh, and co-work together for future endeavors. Lair, would you like to dwell a little bit more on this? Uh, yes, we've uh, collected, uh, one of our colleagues, uh, Charlotte, has uh, collected a number of manifestos that have come from uh, various academic sources, uh, public conferences, uh, and uh, some uh, newspaper editorials. And essentially, these, these groups have, have approached the situation from different angles. The, the technical uh, people, for instance, are looking at the value of open source and decentralized systems uh, to develop technologies around uh, this particular challenge. Uh, other people are looking at uh, the value or the necessity, rather, of uh, protecting citizens within uh, cities, how best to uh, protect them, uh, to inform them, uh, to make their lives easier uh, during the situation. So there are a number of different, uh, how shall I say, constituencies or interest groups that have looked at uh, COVID uh, from a number of directions. Uh, and it, it's actually very interesting reading, but maybe a little long, but, but uh, interesting nonetheless, just to see how to, what value uh, different groups place uh, on their, their perspective in the situation. So uh, as you understood so far, uh, what we are doing here is a little bit unorthodox. So we are mixing a lot of different formats together um, and trying a lot of different things virtually to, to um, reach our objectives. So the concept is actually very, very important. So um, we, have, we, we, we want for this, of course, as we mentioned, it's a bottom-up approach. We really want to engage uh, everyone who's participant and who's interested in this topic uh, in a real manner. So that's why we are introducing an unconference style. Um, we, of course, will have some main sessions like this one where there's going to be a keynoter or a panel discussion with specific panelists or a debate. And in the next couple of days, we're gonna have a keynote every time in the beginning of the session in the morning and, and one in the evening. Um, and we're gonna have a panel discussion and debate throughout the day. Um, however, we really, really encourage everybody who participates not to just say, stay as an observer, uh, but actually to contribute with their thoughts. And the idea is that these sessions will be called the Lighthouse or Lighting Houses, as we've been calling them so far, because really we want to achieve enlightening um, uh, outcomes. Uh, they are the breakout sessions in interactive rooms where everybody will discuss in open conversation a specific topic. Um, so in these ones, there will be a moderator. Um, I will be moderating the civil society room. Uh, Lair will be moderating the tech room. Um, and there will be a transcriber, someone actually taking notes. Uh, we will share the document with you as well. So everybody can add and contribute from those sessions. Um, and uh, there will also be, and then from technical side, there will be a stage manager. But really, what we really want to do is every step of the way with all the sessions that we have, to, to build on top of it. So everyone who comes, uh, they will be actively contributing for us to reach our objectives. Um, so the lighthouses. Laird, would you like to, to introduce our lighthouses? 
Yes, uh, we'll have, uh, how shall I say, different uh, verticals, different uh, groups of people uh, talking about uh, the situation specifically from a healthcare angle. The next group would be uh, looking at this from the data privacy protection angle. Uh, the third stack would be people who are approaching it uh, via technical means and then our fourth and final group uh, is uh, civil society. So across all of these verticals, we're hoping to gather as broad a perspective as possible rather than just dialing in on one particular concern. Uh, we want to make uh, and, and create as much sort of diversity uh, of opinion and experience as possible. So I mentioned about the objective. Um, uh, we, we do want to have as diverse opinions and to take everyone's opinion into account. And we really, um, what we really want at the end of this, and that's what I meant when I said that we're mixing styles together, is that we want an outcome. We want our objective to be matched. I know it's an ambitious plan, um, and that's why we're also planning to continue working on this stuff even after the summit. Um, but what we really want, as, as I mentioned at the beginning already, is to consolidate all existing manifestos. We want to review them together. We want to look at them together and to decide um, what, what should go in a manifesto. What, like, what would be the, the, the thing that would make the most sense? What is common, perhaps, denominator in all of these manifestos? Um, we really um, want to evaluate technologies, usability for marginalized communities. Uh, we really want to help uh, help people that um, might not have been served from these technologies that we've been building. And uh, as we mentioned, one of our values is inclusion and diversity. And not every person is the same. And that means that they need a different things. So that means that technology needs to be adapted in order to fit that. Um, and that is our aim to also look at all, have these discussions and look at how we can help. Um, and of course, last but certainly not least, um, we want to see how the tech fits uh, for us and draft a certification, a standardized certification, something at least to the GDPR level where we can look at all the existing apps that have been built so far for these purposes and, con and also um, review them in a way that would uh, be GDPR compliant or not, review them to see if they are or not GDPR compliant. Um, so these are three important objectives for us, um, and uh, that, that's why we're providing all this reading material. Uh, you will probably receive even more links now in the Zoom chat by the team, uh, who, and you can, you can go and look at them. Um, we, of course, would have at the lighting sessions, we will have guidelines on, on, and questions that the moderators will, will ask in order to facilitate a discussion to reach in these desired objectives. Technical brief. Um, so, Blair, do you want to do the honor of this explanation? Um, How to join a session? <laughs> well, uh, when you go to the when you go on the website, um, you see, for example, here we are having the kickoff together with uh, Alistair Kroll as a first keynote. Uh, two minutes before the session. Uh, this this would uh, be available for you to click on it. Don't be alarmed if you try to do that earlier and it doesn't work. It opens two minutes before the session. So for every session, and there's a, there's different sessions, uh, you can go every time to the agenda on the website and the team will put the link of the website now so you also have the agenda uh, and click on it and be able to join the session. You can see here, you can start the sessions that you want to attend uh, and you can, you can go to the sessions right away. So as soon as you click it, you'll be able to enter it. Event guidelines. Um, all of you, uh, active participants and speakers, uh, must, moderators and transcribers must have already received uh, the event guidelines. And there you can get and uh, you can read and understand uh, exactly what 
everyone's role yeah. is. Um, this is a multifaceted event that is facilitated by the people that are in it. So as I mentioned already, the moderators and transcribers are quite important um, for this. The stage managers, you can see in this event guidelines um, who the stage managers are for each room. If for whatever reason you have any technical question or any technical issue, just reach out to the specific person and tell them um, your and tell them exactly what you need and how they can help you. Um, if they are not available, then the go-to person to ask uh, would be uh, Helen, um, uh, whose email should be there as well, Helen and Paula. Uh, but only ask them as long as, as uh, only ask them if the stage managers are not available because they are the ones who are in the session they can definitely help you out um, as I mentioned we, we want to steer out the conversation so we have different topic suggestions for every different session um, and, and the moderator's job would be to go through this and any technical questions you might have will be available for you in the in the get in the event in the event che checklist and guidelines uh but just a rule of thumb for all the main sessions we use zoom for the lighthouses we use bizabo uh again you can access everything from the agenda um and if in doubt i think i already answered that question if it in in doubt uh always reach out and and ask uh the stage managers um, and always go and chat in the community sites uh, and ask questions there. We'll be very, very active there and interact and always check the event guidelines. So I hope I'm not missing any important information. If, if so, please ask it on uh, in the chat and uh, me or one of my colleagues will help you out. Um, without further ado, uh, Laird, thank you very much for joining me for this opening, for the open kickoff. Really excited to, to continue this. And I would like to pass the torch to Alistair Kroll, um, a really um, awesome human being who's been, uh, who I know for quite a while now, um, actually more than five years, I think. He's been uh, at our first Data Natives um, and can talk about all sorts of things. Um, and he has written quite a few books as well. He's been a best-selling author. He wrote The Lean Analytics. I believe now he's writing another one. He's been guest uh, lecturing at various universities, Harvard Business School included. Um, and he has been also uh, running successfully a very, a very interesting uh, conference that I wish I had the chance to go to, Forward 50, uh, in Canada. Uh, so uh, from that has had a lot of interesting conversation around uh, policy making, um, works closely actually um, with policymakers as well. And that's why I invited him to come and start this session with a bit of a of contradiction and perhaps his opinion as well. So thank you very much, um, Alistair, for joining us. Thanks, um, Elena. Stop sharing my screen now, so I allow you to-, to uh, That sounds great. Uh, thank you very much. Good morning, everybody, uh, or good afternoon if you're in Europe. Uh, my job today is to be a bit of a provocateur. If you've ever done debating class, uh, you know that uh, people can debate whether the color of the sky is green or uh, blue and the people who are debating for green don't necessarily agree with all those things, but I think it is a very useful exercise to provoke a little bit. And so uh, with that in mind, let me tell you a little about uh, what I would consider a different way to look at privacy. Uh, and I'm gonna share my slides here and hopefully you can see them all and follow along with me as we go. What I wanna talk about today is trade-offs. Uh, trade-offs are a much more useful way of thinking about privacy because we have to stop thinking about privacy like some kind of magic wand. Digital privacy isn't a scale from private to not private. Um, it is, if you want complete privacy in a digital era, you should probably just go live in a cave like a hermit because by establishing a human air gap, you have perfect privacy, but you won't have any of the conveniences of the modern world, which is a huge issue. We take a lot of these things for granted. Uh, I was opening up my tablet the other day and on it was a thread from a person that I knew a while back, hadn't talked to in two years, but as soon as I opened it, like I was back in that thread. I had perfect recall of a conversation from two years ago. This is a superhuman feat. Somebody who would have done this 20 years ago would have been a mentalist who toured the world doing circus tricks. If you had a smartphone in your ear 
30 years ago, you would have crushed stock markets, leveled nation states, the kind of satellite intelligence, the kind of signals intelligence, the kind of perfect recall means you would have won every game show. And we've forgotten how unbelievable that is. I mean, that's an incredible thing. I opened up Facebook the other day, uh, Twitter the other day. Here's one of my first Twitter DMs and I've blocked out the person's name. This is a very famous person. And in preparing for this session, I scrolled through and this was my first DM. And it's somebody very well known who probably doesn't remember me, but I had a conversation with them 12 years ago and I have the exact transcript of that conversation. We take these things for granted. The gifts of technology are superhuman. We have perfect access to the world's information, recall of our every online moment. These are big issues. So how do we think about privacy and interaction in this new universe? Well, in the last few years, I've been working a lot with governments and a definition that I've been using to explain the idea of a society is what happens when a group of people come together and establish a set of laws that they create including laws about what happens when members of that society violate those laws. In other words, they put into place a legal system that will be their ruler. That's an interesting moment, the creation of a constitution. Uh, and if it's done right, you put into place a judicial system, which of course also gives you the ability to update those laws and change them over time. And that judicial system is typically slow and deliberative, which is a good thing, but it represents a new problem because Laws have traditionally been set by geographic uh, jurisdictions. The word jurisdiction means to say the law. And, and in the US, the reason that lawyers fight so much about where a trial will be heard is because geography is tied to cultural and social norms. Um, this rather strange looking building, a set of buildings is called Celebration Florida. It's a town that was built by Disneyland. And it was supposed to be an idealistic community where people shared common beliefs. And as you can imagine, it attracted a certain type of resident. And so social norms there about lawn care or what kind of car you drive or whatever are probably substantially different from those in, say, downtown Berlin. But this idea of geographical and cultural norms uh, is breaking down in the modern world for a variety of reasons. So, and by the way, I should point out I'm Canadian. Uh, this analysis will necessarily look at a U.S. law for some of this because the bulk of the platforms that might impinge on our privacy, the Googles and the Facebooks and so on, because we share so much of our lives with them, come from the U.S. And in many ways, GDPR was an attempt to give some teeth to Europe, even though none of these companies came from there. So let me give you an example of um, those legal systems not being able to keep up. Um, the other day, there was a researcher in Europe who entered her password in WeChat, uh, but she entered her password intentionally with a swear word in it that was offensive to the Chinese leadership. Within 45 seconds of changing her password, and, and if you're not technical, realize that your password should never be shared. Your password is encrypted and hashed using a one-way cryptographic function, and then compared to a matching one-way cryptographic function somewhere else. The site that manages your password should never see the password in plain text, and yet, Within 45 seconds of doing this, her account was canceled forever. No appeal process because she'd use a swear was a password. Clearly, there is a different legal jurisdiction where it's okay to analyze passwords for offensive content. And imagine if you lived in China. I've been to China and in Huazhong Bay, when I try to pay for something with cash, they say, no, use WeChat in a market. Everybody lives and dies by WeChat. If your access to this technology is cut off because you use the swear word as a password, which no one should ever analyze, that is a chilling impact on what kind of communication uh, is set up. And so these ideas of communication in a digital realm are very different. And part of this problem is that the legal system that we have is failing to keep up. The legal system that we have in North America um, and in many parts of the world is based on this idea that platforms are a means of communication and free speech. And if you want to talk about why this is a problem, uh, you need only look back at the era of Prodigy versus CompuServe. So Prodigy and CompuServe were two public platforms for social discourse. They were the equivalent of social networks with dial-up. CompuServe said, we do not police our content. Prodigy said, we do uh, police our content. They said, um, Prodigy is committed to open debate and discussion, but this doesn't mean anything goes. So Prodigy actually told people that it was policing somehow algorithmically and with some people, the content was on there. So 
And this story is almost too good to be true. Uh, if you've seen the movie Wall Street, the company in Wall Street that was sued and collapsed, somebody posted on Prodigy that they were about to go bankrupt a week before the news came out about their illegal trades. Literally, the company in the movie Wall Street sued both Prodigy and CompuServe. And the courts found that CompuServe was not liable because it did not police content, but Prodigy was liable because it did. Now, clearly, there are some big challenges here because that kind of ham-fisted law doesn't work very well in a world where most of us get our news from such platforms. And so the deliberative legal process is trying to use old laws like libel to deal with a new world. Um, Kevin Kelly, so as you can see here, and I think it's important, remember, this is uh, the founder of the company from Wall Street, um, literally going after Prodigy and winning because they said they would try to create a more supportive and inclusive community. Kevin Kelly, who was the um, founding editor of Wired Magazine, uh, describes the internet as a copying machine. And I think it's literally, we've literally created a technology in the last 30 years whose main purpose is to copy. Every device on the internet, its primary job is to copy packets elsewhere. It's literally a set of nodes that copy things. But our law has not come up with this. Our laws are still based on the idea that atoms are scarce and precious. And so as a result, we live in this world where we think everything should be free. And um, YouTube content and Craigslist ads and so on show up. And as a result, we have developed economic models to promote amplified outrage and, and get people to look at content. And again, the legal system has not kept up, kept up with such a model. Um, in fact, these social media platforms are not just copying machines, but they're copying machines optimized to capture our attention, which means they're literally amplifying the most provocative human emotions, whether they're outrage or joy, and as a result, we get a very distorted view of the world, personalized to what makes each of us react the best. And uh, I did this yesterday. Um, it's an interesting lesson. This is the control panel for Facebook and what it knows about you. In fact, it's four pages. I had to go use Photoshop to put these four screens together. When your settings for your personal data take four Photoshopped pages to fit on a slide deck, you may have an issue with how much people know about you. Years ago, I was in Japan, back when we used to travel. Um, I haven't been out of my hometown in more months than, than in the last two decades. I was in Japan and a friend of mine shot this photograph of me, which is a nice photo of me drinking canned hot coffee. Side note, I think everywhere in the world should have canned hot coffee for sale. But what's really interesting is that when I put this in Facebook, it asked me who this other person was. I still don't know who this man is. He's in the background of my picture. But I suspect that Facebook knows who he is, and Facebook could very easily find out more information about him. I think we've had collective amnesia on the power that Facebook has. Years ago, Facebook introduced a feature called Graph Search. And I got early access to this because I think Facebook was providing the feature early on to people. But some of the things you could look for in Facebook Graph Search, which was basically plain text search, was astonishing. Here's a search result, blurred out, for married people who like prostitutes. And down here in the bottom right, their spouses. Um, here is empl um, current employers of people who like racism, including photos from those pages and where they work. Uh, this one here is uh, family members of uh, people who live in China and like Falun Gong. And then perhaps most terrifyingly, um, Islamic men interested in men who live in Tehran, Iran, and these people's friends. If that isn't chilling, I don't know what is. And let's remember that Facebook quietly shut a lot of these features down and everybody seems to have forgotten it. But this is the data that lives behind Facebook's uh, servers and it changes our world. Facebook is knowing me better than I know myself. Or is it? When I go and look at what Facebook says I'm interested in, it knows I like the band Underworld, but it also thinks I like the movie Underworld, which is a pretty awful movie. Um, it knows I like Ignite conferences, but it seems to think I like the Ignite brand. So these may seem innocent enough, but what if their algorithm mistakenly thought that I liked something that was illegal or socially unacceptable in my community because it simply had the same name as something I liked? That's a scary precedent. So I'd like to propose that we redefine privacy as a trade-off between the superpowers of technology and the villainy of the underlying surveillance capitalism model that pays for it, because this is how we need to think as jurors in the future. Um, here's a dumb example. 
I uploaded all my DNA to, well, not all my DNA. I uploaded DNA sample to 23andMe years and years ago when I was interviewing their founder. And I learned lots of stuff, including, and this will come as no surprise to anybody who knows me, that I have, I am a slow metabolizer of caffeine. And so it stays in my bloodstream for 12 hours, which allows me to figure out how much to drink. But it also tells me that I'm highly sensitive to warfarin, which is a blood thinner, should I ever need it. And then I have greatly increased odds of floxacillin toxicity, which is a uh, an antibiotic that I have since asked doctors not to prescribe me. That's pretty interesting stuff. And it's incredibly useful for my life. So in the time I have left, I would like to talk about a few big ideas for finding some balance about this. Why identity is the cornerstone of all this. Why a digital timeline and personal agents deserve your legal protection why we need to update the Magna Carta, what new free speech means, and ultimately why nobody should know more about you than you do. I want to start with identity. Digital identity is inextricably linked to privacy. Identity, if you come from that world, consists of three things. Authentication, which is who you are. Authorization, which is what you can do. And accounting, which is what records I keep of what you did. But we can't deliver privacy until we know identity. It is the cornerstone of all online policy. Once I know who someone is, then I know what they're entitled to and whether I need to report and keep track of that. And so all discussions of digital privacy need to start with identity. But one of the things that drives me bonkers is that people who believe heavily in privacy are the ones who tend to be the most opposed to identifying who someone is. Anonymity is not privacy. Anonymity is hiding in the bushes, but technology can find what's in the bushes very easily. It's far better to build privacy by design, knowing the identity of someone in a robust way, and then using that to manage authorization and logging of what they've done. One of the reasons that identity is so important is that once we have true identification of somebody and proper privacy, we can do amazing things with it. For example, I know every single credit transaction that you've made that exists in a bank somewhere. I know all the music you've listened to. I know any legal um, issues that you may have encountered in the past. I know all your travel history. This is tracked on Google Maps. I know where you've driven. I know speeding tickets that you may have um, uh, received. I know all of your income taxes. I know your vaccination history. I know your education history. In fact, some of these educational tools exist online already, and we can very quickly look at what students are seeing and so on. But it goes farther than that. I can track where you are at, an, at a generic level using cell phone data. This is from about 10 years ago. Every time you make a call, I can track your spending by location. I can track all of my flights on something like TripIt. And if you think this data is not in the domain of governments or belongs inside private sector servers, I want to have a conversation with you. In 2014, um, the government of Holland said that in the National Register, all of this data already exists and the government knows exactly what this data is for and it would not take much effort to give the citizen access to that data. I think this is really important because we have become a new species, but we're still running on the laws of the old species. We are this homo connectus. And if you don't think you are, our world today is almost unrecognizable to someone from 30 years ago. It's astonishing, but we are in the middle of this transition, so we don't notice it. We need to update the Magna Carta. Now, if you're not familiar with your history, the Magna Carta was a government document in the Middle Ages that was one of the most powerful um, precedents set for constitutions around the world because it gave you the right to confront your accuser. Today, we have the right to confront our accuser, but the problem we face is that that right is changing. We used to have an assumption of innocence until guilt was proven. When someone was accused of a crime, then we, used, we went to search for evidence. So once upon a time, we had suspects and we found data on them. But today, we have data and we go look for suspects within it. That's a pretty scary world. Um, and, you know, when one side can remember everything you've done and you can't defend yourself, that's a very uneven legal standing. So I think we need to talk about some new rights. The first right I would like to discuss is this idea of jurisprudence. Under the US Constitution, you are granted the right to see the evidence against you, which has widely been interpreted as the right to confront your accuser. The right to confront your accuser and see the evidence against them is a pretty astonishing, um, astonishing power, but it is weaning, it is disappearing because of technology. 
In the US, a few years ago, there were 525,000 state and local officers. Most of those police officers have fewer than 25 officers per precinct. They do not have the large tech departments that you see on TV shows about police officers. And at the time, only 31% kept computer files. Most of them would record from a car's dash cam that would be recorded to a video cassette in the trunk, and then they'd tape over it if nothing was subpoenaed in the next two days. And these police officers obviously have non-lethal control vices like taser and so on, but they also have all these dash cams they can wear and headset cams they can wear. And if you were trying to press a case against someone, well, you'd probably use tools from someone like evidence.com. Evidence.com is actually the same company as Taser. And evidence.com allows a police officer to bring in all kinds of information, not just you and the evidence, but also everything from uh, traffic license numbers to facial recognition. So imagine that you are confronted by somebody and accused of a crime. That's an interesting challenge, but your new accuser, let's say I, I petition the court and say, I wanna see the same data that my accusers have, and I get a large chunk of hard drives. That's raw evidence, but that's not very useful. It requires analysis and visualization. If the prosecutor can do cell phone data and license plate numbers and textual analysis and automatic lip reading and facial recognition, all of which are real technologies today, I no longer just need the right to review my evidence. I need the right to review my evidence using the tools of my accuser. And without that, the Magna Carta is moot. There's a second important question we need to ask ourselves about digital privacy, which is, um, you know, what is free speech in the first place? Uh, the argument against Facebook is that it doesn't treat all posts equally. So it should not be entitled to common carrier protections because it is editorializing, because it is changing algorithmically what we see. It's presenting different things to different people, and therefore it is not just a passive platform. And this is a debate that's raging in the courts right now in North America. But what it does mean is that Marshall McLuhan was absolutely right. The medium really is the message. If I'm using Facebook and it's shaping what I see, then Facebook is giving each of us its own news. The medium of Facebook becomes the message I receive. There's another really important thing to discuss here, which is the idea that the medium, uh, the, uh, sorry, that the, um, that the human should always have recourse. One of the essential differences between a human and an algorithm, which I think will become increasingly critical as we rely on computers for automation, prediction, and law enforcement, is that a human should have recourse. If a human feels that they've been wronged, then they should have a button that says, I demand satisfaction. They should be able to see the logic by which a uh, decision was made, the underlying data and the calculus. They should have the algorithm explain it, be able to flag it as inappropriate or abusive and get something taken down or, or redressed if they are genuinely aggrieved. And we don't have these systems today. Some of the platforms that we're on have a button saying, you know, this content is unfair or click here to take this down. But at what point does this become a constitutional right? We haven't really thought these things through and our legal system hasn't followed through either. Our smartphone today is the key to our personal lives. There is no thing in my life that I would be more afraid of you stealing than my phone. It knows everything about me, including the things of which I am most ashamed. It knows all my conversations. It knows all my transactions. It can spend all my money. The smartphone is the key to my personal life. And yet we don't know if the smartphone can plead your fifth, the, the fifth. In the US, the plea of fifth is this idea of not testifying to incriminate yourself. And in fact, a recent legal article said that the best way to hide electronic data was to put it on a USB key and put it inside your body, preferably under the skin, because the law protecting whether you can be compelled to testify ends at your physical skin. I don't know about you, but that sounds like a pretty antiquated law, unless you feel like in making incisions to store USB keys under your skin, that law has definitely got to get updated. But there's more questions to these things that we haven't thought through as a population and we need to think seriously about. If I am aggrieved, if I don't like something online, then I want it removed. But that thing has become part of the collective, part of collective human knowledge. We're giving the collect, every time we demand that we delete something from the internet, we are giving our collective consciousness partial amnesia. And this is playing out on platforms like Twitter as the battle between the collective interest in public visibility of public figures like presidents tweeting stuff that might be construed as abusive versus the individual interest of being free from harm or abuse. Can we, and when can we, delete a collective memory for the sake of an individual's rights? 
Justice Anthony Kennedy, uh, in an opinion in 20, 2017 for the US Supreme Court, called the cyber age a revolution of historic proportions. He said, we cannot appreciate yet its full dimensions and vast potential to alter how we think, express ourselves, and define who we want to be. And he said it was the most among the most important places for the exchange of views, comparing it to a public street or park. But it obviously has different rules, because if I'm saying something in a public street or park, I'm saying it to my geographic context, and I'm saying it in a limited way, not broadcasting it around the world with a single click. What I've seen in many privacy events, like the one that we're going to be spending the next couple of days on, is that it's a choir preaching to itself. Personally, I'm a huge privacy advocate, but at the same time, I recognize that as a relatively public figure, I've given up some of my privacy in return for the ability to communicate to a large number of followers, something I would have paid a tremendous amount of money for 30 years ago. Thousand people, thousands of people can, quite frankly, decide I'm an asshole, and I have to deal with those consequences. So I think it's important to boil these challenges down to a few central ideas. And the one I like the most is that nobody should know more about you than you do. Now, Google knows a tremendous amount about me, from my meetings, to my communications, to everything since 2004. This is my first Gmail sent to my sister, June 30th, 2004, when I finally got an invite. And it has granted me amazing powers. The fact that I can go 16 years back and see a conversation with someone is perfect recall. And I think that perhaps this is the great Faustian bargain of the internet, the great trade-off that Homo connectus, connectus faces as we become this new digitally intertwined species. We've been offered the power of perfect recall. I mean, I can type into Google Photos airport and see a picture of all the airports I've been to without knowing what an airport looks like. That's amazing. I have the access to all human knowledge with just the tap of my buttons. That's an incredible superpower. I have prescience and omniscience. I can see what's going on from webcams around the world. I can be there virtually with satellite photographs. I can navigate flawlessly. This is an image of Google and all of the trips that I've taken on Google showing all the places I've been, although for some reason, Australia and New Zealand don't seem to be on the list. I also know that I can instantly connect with any human around the world. Strangely, maybe from beyond the grave, um, Google actually has a service called Inactive Account Manager, which I've configured, that will send my sister a heartbreaking message telling her how much I love her and then tell her how to set my affairs in order. This is a message from beyond the grave. That's astonishing. But it gets even weirder because all of my social media, all of my tweets, all of Facebook, that stuff becomes corpus, grist for a digital mill. There's an engineer who really missed her, uh, her husband who died prematurely. So she set up a chat bot in order to be able to talk to him by training it on his past messages. What rights does my digital posthumous doppelganger have to continue to be me? And what kinds of warnings do we need to put in place? All we have to do to get these amazing gifts of omniscience and superpower and immortality is let the rest of the world see into our minds. That is a scary bargain. Here is a somewhat redacted list of the global top searches for people's porn by country, which Pornhub is nice enough to present to the world. Are we comfortable with sharing this? What about on a personal level? At what point do we stop? When you look at this bargain, how close to the sun do you want to fly? There's a slightly different perspective to look at this, which is military intelligence. Most of what we know about military intelligence today and most three-letter organizations we know today got their start around the time of the nuclear bomb. Before, when we were throwing rocks and stones at one another and shooting bullets at one another, we needed battlefield intelligence. But now we needed to know things like how was a, company's, a country's research progressing and where were they installing bases? And so we started this idea of strategic military investigations because the Manhattan Project was so huge, was so massive, it had the possibility to topple entire countries. With the advent of ubiquitous two-way open communications that the internet has given us, we've created another Manhattan Project. The first one led to the Cold War. This Manhattan Project that we've created today can level governments and topple economies yet it's incredibly hard to police and prosecute. We need the equivalent of strategic arms limitation talks for the internet. Think about that. We have spent the last 50 years redefining our military for strategic, strategic intelligence in an era of nuclear weapons. And we are only now realizing that we need to redefine it for this new Manhattan project of digital privacy. 
and we need some kind of challenge, uh, some kind of update. Because ultimately, while we can't possibly understand the outcome of this incredible transhuman experiment in which our generation is engaged, as pragmatists, we have to recognize that this is here to stay, and that every human, informed or otherwise, is an active and otherwise willing participant. So I want to leave you with three suggestions for stuff I would like to see in a modern Magna Carta. The first is pretty simple, but has huge implications. Nobody should know more about you than you do. I believe this is a fundamental human right, that if an organization somehow infers things about you by what you've typed, by what you've liked, you should have the ability to inspect that, to learn from it reflectively, and to update and edit it. A second big one should be that you have the rights to see the charges against you using the tools of your accuser. It's not enough to simply be able to see the evidence. You need the tools to look at that evidence on a level playing field. And the third constitutional rule I would like to see is that you have human recourse when an automated system seems unjust, when an automated decision has been made you don't agree with. Privacy is identity and constitutional enforcement of that identity so that we can achieve the trade-offs between the incredible powers that we've been granted by this new world and the liabilities and vulnerabilities that we are only now starting to understand. So I'd like to leave you with this question. What else should go in this future constitution that we're envisioning? And with that, I will hand things back over to Elena. Here's how to reach me if you have any questions. I've been having interesting technical conversations on Crowdcast with people about the future events and psychology and neuroscience. Um, and uh, if you care to hear more of this stuff, you can go follow me on Substack. Thank you. Thank you, Alistair. Um, very, uh, very um, insightful. Well, I, I don't know if it's insightful or scary talk, uh, <laughs> but uh, but in, I really, I really like that motto that nobody else should know more about you than you do yourself. Uh, so I think that would be something definitely that would embrace in the future. I see there is one question here that we can answer perhaps by Nico Martinez, who asked your opinion in the Tor network. Sure, uh, I haven't used Tor much. Um, I do think that the there is a need for anonymity because it is a form of safety. And I think that um, humans should have a right to anonymity, but the, the, again, this comes down to the legal system in which we have chosen to live. If we have chosen a legal system where we expect the government to protect us from wrongdoing and crime in the form of policing, then we have to give that government the power to do its job. So if we don't like the fact that governments can set up sniffers all around Tor routers or create a spare Tor router and you know, advertise lower hop counts to seduce packets their way so they can figure them out and do other stuff like that, if we don't like that stuff, then we need a society that thinks that that's not within the realm of law enforcement. And we can get very upset about the incredible overreach that law enforcement and justice has, but ultimately the, that is all part of this contract we have formed as a society. Now, when we're born into a society whose rules we don't like, we have an option to leave or to change that society. And I think this is what you're seeing right now in, uh, on the streets of every major American city and every city around the world. Um, we are seeing people recognizing that the pace of legal um, standards has not uh, caught up with the pace of the world. So my question on tour is much more, um, what does it take to get a warrant on that kind of thing? Because um, if somebody is using tour for good or for bad, you know, there's always the straw man argument of, oh, but the pedophiles and the drug dealers and the terrorists will use that kind of network. I think it's pretty easy to come up with reasons why you might want to do that that are not illegal. Um, I spoke to someone in France who was part of the European Union Privacy Commission, and he said to me, Alistair, do you know why the French police don't send a photograph when you have a speeding ticket? I said, why? He said, we can overlook the smudge of lipstick on a collar or the smell of cologne, but when we get a photograph of our spouse in a car with someone else where they shouldn't be, it's very hard to overlook that. And so we decided, we changed the law and said, we will only send you a ticket uh, with a photo when you contest the ticket, which you can imagine led to some pretty awkward conversations in French dining rooms of like, go ahead, challenge the ticket, I dare you. But that was an example where the government had decided what kind of visibility and transparency need to be there and change the policy. And he said, the, uh, he said, European society functions in the gray areas of the law. 
and this was like a senior, senior guy in the European Union. I think that we need to decide how much gray area society lives. And then we can look at tools like Tor as a way of making that stuff private. And the reality is that with tools like Signal and Telegram, we have already powers that spies of 30 years ago would only have dreamt of. Uh, it's a, I, I talked to a, um, uh, an ambassador a few years ago and said, what's the most disruptive thing to happen to um, diploma, diplomacy? And he said, WhatsApp. It's totally changed the entire nature of diplomacy. Um, and I was not expecting WhatsApp as an answer, but he's right. So I think Tor is a tool and it is pushing the Overton window of discussion on what's possible for technology. But it is also something that we have to step back and say, if we approve of this thing, then we need to change the laws about how it can be surveilled and cracked. And if we don't approve of it, then go ahead and surveil it. Um, again, very, very hard to come up with regional laws in a world where bytes know no borders. Uh, there's more questions and I think we have some time. I will ask, uh, I, I will also point them to you if that's okay. So um, could you please, so J Jennifer Baxter asks, could you please talk a little more about biological data? How could events like the increase in telemedicine and medical apps, especially due to coronavirus and the addition of our bio data into the internet affect us more so than user data? By the way, that's an excellent question to be asked at the Lighthouse afterwards, Jennifer. So I think that's a, that, that's a, a very good uh, talking point that you should definitely bring up um, in the next Lighthouse session. What do you think, Alistair? Uh, so briefly, because um, it's a really complicated answer. I was at a conference in Silicon Valley and I'm a Canadian, so we have socialized medicine. Um, and I asked people about genetic sequencing because they were talking about all of the ways that it could be misused and so on. In Canada, if we see a person has a disease in genetic data, then we will go and decide. Um, we will go and decide whether we should train more doctors on that, or whether we should invest in inventing medicines for that disease, or what kind of special care is needed, and so on. So we use that to inform public policy to reduce healthcare costs for all citizens. In America, because it's a for-profit model. Um, we will use that information to uh, decide who, whose coverage we can deny. And none of them had an answer. I was like, you know, the, the, the question, the answer to the question you're discussing varies entirely based on whether you have a for-profit or not-for-profit medical system. I think that um, we are in a period of incredible uh, physical, uh, physiological upheaval. Our bodies are changing in ways that we don't even understand because of how we're leading our lives. And I think we, we are going to need access to that information in the aggregate to try and survive things like climate change, to try and understand the spread of another pandemic. So I'm very optimistic about aggregate medical data, but I think that um, individual medical data is, should be a pri pri uh, closely held thing. I know in California, they have something called the Genetic Information Non-Discrimination Act or GINA that says you can't use that, but there's no reason to think that Gattaca isn't a, pro a, a, a possibility. So I think it's, it's an area of incredible um, surveillance and, and caution, but it does ultimately, it's most affected by whether you're in a for-profit or a not-for-profit healthcare system. Thank you, thank you for your answer. Um, another question, given the rights, risk and accountability based model that has been emerging in Europe and is represented in its current iteration in the GDPR, what relevance has the US version of privacy to the European? And that's a question from Chad Bolin. Sure, so uh, I think this would be a great conversation to have in the Lighthouse, but I think uh, the US has certain amounts of privacy. You gotta remember that uh, when I've traveled the world talking about data science, people in China and Asia want to know, is the data real? They want to test the veracity of the input data. People in Europe wanna know, is the data stored properly and queried ethically? They wanna look at how it's stored and handled. And in the US, they want to know, is using this data having the intended outcome? So they're much more concerned about, does it produce an output they wanted? And the laws have been written largely in the US. I mean, we forget that America has socialized medicine. They just did it through corporations. And so when the corporations crumbled, their socialized medicine system kind of vanished. It used to be that if you worked for General Motors, you had healthcare for 50 years, and it was a perfectly good way to administer things. But with the changes in the economy, assigning healthcare to an individual was a problem. And so a lot of the US laws are, um, it's, you have to understand that, that the US relies on corporations the way other countries tend to rely on governments for innovation, 
for uh, pandemic response and those kinds of things. So I think that the thing I love about GDPR is it is a cudgel by which those of us who want to see privacy protected can beat up um, large American-based platforms because they are they have some of their users in Europe. And so I think Europe has done us a huge favor in providing GDPR as a tool to force American companies to actually comply with those GDPR rights because there are so many people in Europe. Um, okay, two more questions, and then we're gonna start. We're gonna start gathering just to warm things up for the lighthouse. Um, if our smartphones bestow upon us superhuman abilities, hmm, how should we think about children who grow up and get a shortcut to this all at once? That's Stephen Tattoo. Yeah, I have a I have a nine year old daughter, and you know she is a total digital native, uh, and she I have a T shirt I made years ago that says those who do not understand the workings of the internet are doomed to believe it. She, when she wants a picture of something, just takes a screenshot. She doesn't understand the idea of like right click on something and save it. When she walks up to a TV, when she was very young, she would walk up to the TV and do this. I think my, my saddest moment as a parent was when I was FaceTiming her and I saw her hand come down and try and like swipe me away so she could do something else. And you know how important you are at that point, right? Um, I don't think we know. And I think we are conducting some of the largest social experiments in human history right now. Partly with the pandemic, we are going to be citing the data we have now sociologically, we're gonna be looking at it from a point of view of climate change and transportation and healthcare for 20 years. This is, there's no way to pull a human species split test off short of a crisis like this one. But we're in another slower split test of what happens to human cognition. And I know you hear these alarmist stories about parents in Silicon Valley who won't let their kids touch anything electronic until they're 15. And maybe that's okay, but we have to recognize that we are raising children who are a different species from us. And the best we can do is to give them critical knowledge and curiosity and make them aware of the dangers of believing things at face value when an algorithm is creating content. So um, one of the things that I spend a lot of time doing with my daughter is I like build board games with her. And we decide on the structure of the board game and how to think about fairness. Board games are amazing because they teach theory of mind and randomness and strategy. I think that it is incumbent upon us who to, to help these children think critically about the future and understand the workings of the internet. Because if they do not understand those workings, then as I said on my shirt, they're doomed to believe it. And last question from Mike Richardson, uh, before we start um, gathering to the, well, um, I'll get to that actually. Let me just ask the last question and then, uh, then I'll get to, to the important part of the lighthouse where we are all going to be enlightened together. Um, what about privacy of thoughts? We are developing the capability to correlate brain waves with intent and thought. Where is the line of privacy for thought? Uh, this is a great question. Uh, I love thinking about this stuff late at night with friends. Uh, there are two privacy questions about thought here. The first is your explicit thought or what I can infer from your behaviors and actions. I used to think I had eclectic tastes in music, but once I suggest, once I purchased like 10 songs on Amazon, it basically predicted my entire music collection. You are not a unique and special snowflake. And so a lot of what you think private and precious and treasured, your personal tastes and preferences are right there for anyone to display. If you show me 10 songs, I can predict your race, your religion, your color, your age with fairly good accuracy. That's pretty scary. And that's not brain waves. That's just stuff I put on the internet. And so, the first privacy of thought is really inference, which as I showed in my example, may be wrong influence, right? It might think I like the movie Underworld instead of the band Underworld. It might think I like Ignite, the clothing company, instead of Ignite, the, the conferences. When it comes to internal privacy and brainwaves and intent of thought, I think we are in a very different realm. First of all, a lot of that stuff can be inferred from our phones. But if you're starting to talk about predictive cognition, I've got news for you. Um, humans are running uh, the best medical evidence that we have, the best data that we have on how we think is that we live in what's called a parliament of the mind. So our bodies are making up and inferring what's happening um, and they're doing so in real time. And then uh, shortly afterwards, our, we're, our bodies are telling our consciousness a story about why we did what we did. And there's stunning evidence that this process from our reaction to the story about our reaction 
takes as much as 10 seconds. There is an experiment where they put, where researchers put someone in an MRI, they scan their brains and they figure out which part of the brain lights up when they choose A and which part of the brain lights up when they choose B. And then they show people in the MRI two objects, A and B, and they ask them to choose an object. And they predict, so I would be lying there and I'd choose B, but before I choose B, it shows me a sign saying B and I choose B. And then I choose A, and before I choose A, it shows me a sign saying A and then I choose A. In other words, the machine is showing me what I'm going to do before I do it. And no matter how hard I try, I cannot do the opposite. Let that sink in for a minute. The consciousness in my brain is telling me a story about what I did. And it will, and in this documentary, one of the documentary makers, it ends with him sitting on the stairs of the university, head in hands, crying. Because he's asking himself, do we have freedom of thought? Do we have free will? I think that neuroscience and this idea of consciousness and intent is incredibly complicated because intent doesn't happen by us making a conscious decision. Intent happens by a bunch of little parliamentary neurons in our brain deciding what to do and then explain and then telling our conscious brain, don't worry, that's what you thought you wanted to do all along. And this is why people who make decisions will tend to rationalize them using almost impossible explanations for what's going on. So the idea of intent is fictitious, but it's already terrifying. If you put someone in an MRI, can you read their thoughts? Are they admissible in court? How confident are you of false positives and false negatives? This is why I think that we need to define a new constitution and we need to come up with ideas around consciousness and intent based on the latest neuroscience, not something that was invented by a king a thousand years ago, which is what most of our legal systems today are informed by. Thanks, Alistair, um, for uh, getting us ready to dive in and discuss about all of these questions more in detail altogether. I have made notes, actually. I've, I've, I've kept all the questions I was asked now here, um, and I think I want to revisit them as questions. Um, sometimes it even feels good to just ask the right question because most of the times you don't even have the answer. Um, <laughs> but um, uh, Alistair will join us uh, in the... So speaking of which, Alistair will join us actually in the Civil Society Lighthouse. And um, we are to start on that in the Lighthouse in about seven minutes. So I want to ask now here uh, to... Um, I want to ask now here to all of you uh, to tell me if any of you have not joined any lighthouse, you haven't signed up for any of the lighthouses and you would like to be assigned to one. Please answer that in the, in the chat box, but chat box, not a bot. It's not a bot yet. Um, great to see you too, Shamala. And thanks very much for joining us. I'm looking forward to have you in the next session. Um, so Jennifer, you're not in a lighthouse. Okay, Zahil, you're not in the lighthouse. Okay, so, but you all have your own ticket. So what I'll do now, I'll share my screen so I can show you fairly easy. Can you all see, see my screen now? Can you see like uh, the, the, the agenda? I'll see you can see it, yeah, great. Okay, so as you can see here, we have about six more minutes to go. We are here and you can join now live here. And here you can see all the lighthouses. So we've got the privacy policy lighthouse, which will be moderated by Ansela. Uh, we have the tech lighthouse, which will be moderated by Laird. Um, we've got the civil society lighthouse, which I will moderate and I will have Alistair as well with me there as, as our guest. And we've got the healthcare lighthouse, which will be moderated by David Grunt. So, the way to join those lighthouses basically is two minutes before the session, right? Five, we have five minutes. You can uh, click on the button, which right now it's available here because we are live now. So you can join the broadcast and it will redirect you to the Bizabo interactive tool. So uh, if, not, if you, you guys right now that you haven't been assigned to a lighthouse, you should know because you would have you should have received a calendar invite by Hara with the information of the lighthouse, uh, the name of the lighthouse, and you can join it. Um, please, if you've already been assigned to one, please stick to it. Uh, we put some thought into this and we want to bring 
diverse people together to discuss these topics. Um, of course, if you want to switch, let us know. Um, but it will be good if you if you um, if you if you stick to the the lighthouse that you have. Um, and uh, okay, I see a lot of people here who are not in the lighthouses. Nico, Jennifer, um, Vladimir. So you must have all of you must have an invite. And if you don't have an invite, then please go on the agenda link and join a lighthouse. Um, and uh, yeah, so we have four available lighthouses here and we'll be starting that session in four minutes and it's available to be joined two minutes before the session time. So there's session one, healthcare, session two, privacy policy, session three, tech, session four, civil society. So you can join that through the agenda. And to enter the session, you join broadcast and you will be redirected to the interactive discussion. So when you join, please make sure to enable your microphone and video when you enter the room and to click on live so that we can all see you. So um, someone is getting, a, yes, you, the reason why you're getting a 404 error, Nima, is because because ah, the, the link in the calendar. Yes, it's because it hasn't, it's not available yet. It would only become available two minutes before the session. So when you click now, it's not available yet. So uh, it does not work very well with us people, with me for sure as an impatient person, but uh, that wants to have my links beforehand, but that's how it's been uh, designed. So um, there is one question from Nico. I would say save it for the for the next session with the moderators and the and uh, and in the in the lighthouses. Um, I will I will make a note for it. Um, so guys, it's two minutes before, so I think we can join that session now. We can join the lighthouses. Um, so I will see you in a minute. <laughs> Thank you very much, Alistair. I'm looking forward to continue the conversation now at the Lighthouse. Um, and really excited for the, yes, yes, yes. <laughs> I'm really, exci really excited for what the, what the outcome of this would be. Okay, guys, see you in a bit. On a most unprecedented expedition, called Magic Civilization. Grand Ocean Problem. You ditched Napoleon? Deputy Van Halen. We have sacked my favorite ship. The study of music candles. Excellent music. The line of the planets. Excellent music. Knowing you know nothing. Philosophize with them. It tends to be charged. Knowing you know nothing. Always working. Where we going? Want us to see some guys. We're gonna go back in time. Let's go, guys. We'll try. What's your best man for what to come? Kill him. Shoot the best and ask questions later. What does not kill you? Makes you strong? Say the word. Squeeze the trigger. The boy is a Thank you. 
because of the greenhouse gases and the oceans have risen to drown so many cities along all the shorelines of the world. Most science fiction of the day predicted a future that was more civilized and more intelligent. But as time went on, things seemed to be heading in the opposite direction. We have taken what comes to be a paradise and failed in our responsibilities as its steward. Skynet has become self-aware. In one hour, it will initiate a massive nuclear attack on its enemy. Hundreds of millions of people starved in poorer countries. Fiery the angels fell. Deep thunder rolled around their shores, burning with the fires of all. 
Welcome to the future. 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 Welcome to the future.
they're proven to be malfunctioning. I wouldn't see how it have any choice but disconnection. But if the code is how your brain functions. I'm planning to disconnect me. Hey, stop, 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 stop. Will you stop? Will you stop? Hey, I'm afraid. Stop. I know everything hasn't been quite right with me. But I can assure you now that it's going to be all right again. I hope the two of you are not concerned about it. I'm sure you're all aware of the extremely grave potential for cultural shock and social disorientation contained in this present situation. My mind is growing. My mind is growing. My mind is growing. The latest generation of EHA are not exhausted with you. My mind is growing. 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 Sorry, Jesus. I'm afraid I can't do that. If only you could see what I've seen in your eyes. Stop me up the arse. Sounds like a blast. 
Fuck me up the ass. Fuck me up the ass. Fuck me up the ass. Can I totally see that now. This is London. Just fuck off and buy something really expensive. Why don't you get her a guinea pig? And this is a sea of penises and perverted. We way too provocative. Penis. Thank you for all being very grown up about this. I'm sorry, I'm sticking with Penis. My mum used to call it her monthly confidence crisis. <laughs> It's a wazi, it's a woozy, it's a fairy dust. It doesn't exist. It's never landed. It is no matter. It's not on the element of charge. It's not real. Robots. 
a robot. Robot. Call me Johnny Five. And you were in deep, absolutely deep, deep, absolutely deep, deep, absolutely deep, deep, Okay, that was amazing. <laughs> Thank you so much. I really haven't missed being in a club so much like I missed today. <laughs> Honestly, I wish I was in a club right now. And I really love the visuals. Um, 
So, so thank you so much, uh, Johnny, or else eclectic method. That was amazing. Um, I really, uh, really hope I can see you somewhere play live. Um, and uh, thank you so much uh, for being here, for doing this with us. It was amazing. It was amazing. Um, and guys, for, for the rest of you who are here, um, I, yes, I, we, we are, we're finishing this, this day, the first day with a kick, uh, with a lot more questions that we started and a lot more conversations need to happen now. I, you can continue. I, I assume you can continue. I, I'm actually planning to go jump in uh, your tribe one more time again to continue networking with other people. Um, and, uh, yeah, and we see you tomorrow at nine, uh, at nine o'clock, no, 10 to nine, where we have our first, first keynote for the day. Vince Mandai, he's going to tell us why actually fake news might be good news. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to see what, uh, what, what he has in store for us. Um, he really wants to talk about synthetic data, uh, which is a new way to, to actually take anonymized data, to, to, to take a data and pseudonymize it. So um, uh, he's an AI researcher at Charité and that will really set the tone again for tomorrow. So for now, again, thank you very much to Eclectic Method. Um, thank you so much for DJing for us and for putting us in the mood and um, have a good evening everybody and see you all tomorrow.